Okay, hi everyone. Um, this is our next webinar for the National Research Collaborative for Foster Alumni in Higher Ed for the webinar series. Um, my name is Amy Salazar. I'm an assistant professor at Washington State University and I host the webinars. Um, here on the screen you will see that um, my contact information as well as the website for uh, the uh, National Research Collaborative. If you wanna share that with anyone, um, that's the way to join to start getting our emails. Um, I'd like to ask all of you to please keep your uh, videos off during the webinar and use, if you have questions that come up for you, please use the chat box um, for, for those. And at the end of the presentation today, I will read out any questions that you all pose to our presenter for him to answer. Um, so I just before we get started on today's webinar, I wanted to tell you about our next webinar, our sixth webinar. It's scheduled for Tuesday, June 25th from 11 to noon Pacific time, which is 2 to 3 Eastern time. And the presenter for that webinar will be Debbie Rauscher. She's the project director from the John Burton Advocates for Youth in California. And her presentation um, entitled From Research to Policy, Lessons Learned from California, We'll discuss how California's collective impact effort, known as California College Pathways, has strategically invested in programs, research, data, and advocacy to motivate large-scale systems change designed to improve post-secondary outcomes for youth in care. This webinar will share the intentional, how the intentional inclusion and investment in research and evaluation of their practice has directly informed state policy and enabled the leverage of over $80 million since 2015. Um, so, uh, if you haven't received the link to register for that webinar, please email me and I can help you um, help you get connected with that. Okay, so to give you a little bit of the idea for the agenda today, um, we will, our presenter will have about 35 to 40 minutes to present and then we'll open it up after that for Q&A. Um, and again, for Q&A time, we'll just have you type in your questions and if you're not joining us by internet, please, uh, you can email me your questions if you don't have a way, if you're not connected to the Zoom um, chat, and I will, um, and I'll answer those by email, or we'll, I'll read those out from your emails. Okay, so today our, pre uh, our presenter is Fred Kingston. Um, Fred Kingston has been working with foster youth for 15 years and is still learning a lot about the wild landscape of higher education. He manages the team at the College Success Foundation that supports statewide implementation of the Passport to Careers program and the backbone support for the Washington, the state of Washington's Washington Passport Network. Um, so Fred, I will hand it over to you. Great, thanks Amy. I'm gonna attempt to share my screen here. Okay, can folks see my screen? Can you see that, Amy? I can, yes. Great. So like Amy mentioned, I'm here to talk about um, some exciting collective impact work going on in Washington State, all focused on supporting uh, better outcomes really for students from foster care um, across the P20 continuum, but with a focus on higher education, improving higher education outcomes. Um, so my goal today is I want to talk to you about our three parallel efforts that um, College Success Foundation is involved with that really are about shaping policy, training and supporting practitioners, and directly supporting 
students. Um, so there's a lot of content that I'm going to kind of move through quickly. And I know Amy mentioned you can chat questions um, to her, and I, I look forward to answering your questions. Um, I'm also going to send this PowerPoint presentation to Amy to disseminate to you. Um, and at the end, there's contact information for myself and um, some other folks who can answer any um, kind of more in-depth questions that you may have. So I'm conscious that this may provoke a lot of uh, more questions I can answer in the time I have today, but um, I'm just going to charge through a bunch of information. So um, we have three parallel efforts that are unfolding right now in Washington State that are all focused on supporting students from foster care. And the first one I'm going to talk about is Project Education Impact, or PEI. And you can see these are kind of summarized here um, on this first slide. So PEI has been around since 2017. Um, it is legislative directed, legislatively directed, meaning that um, we get our charter from the Washington State Legislature. And the, the uh, language that gives us that charter is actually written into a budget proviso and it directs uh, state agencies to participate along with nonprofit um, organizations um, on an ongoing basis um, in service of this 2027 impact goal, which I'll talk more about, which is really about reaching um, educational equity for um, students from foster care. And I should mention, um, we, the, the other group of students that we focus on are unaccompanied homeless youth. So although strategies may be different to help support these separate groups of students, they are both foster youth and unaccompanied homeless youth um, at the center of the PEI work. Um, the next uh, initiative I'm gonna talk about is the Washington Passport Network. And this is really the um, community of practice of professionals that support young people in foster care and those experiencing unaccompanied youth homelessness who are in high school or in GED programs and aspire to attend college or those who are already in um, post-secondary education or training who are accessing um, support from the network to complete. And then Passport to Careers is our state-funded scholarship program for students. So I'm going to go ahead and launch into talking about PEI and then um, in a little more depth, and then I'll address the WPN, the PTC, and how these projects interrelate. So I mentioned that our charter gives us um, uh, kind of a, a mandate um, to come up with a plan um, for, uh, that really instructs the legislature, the Washington State Legislature, on the policies and budget requirements for educational success for youth from foster care. And this slide just shows the membership of PEI. Um, you can see that there's five participating state agencies. And one of the exciting things about this group is that we have decision making, uh, we have folks with decision making ability at the table. So either um, the, the secretary of these um, these agencies or their designees are in the group so that um, when decisions have to be made by the group, we can get sign off in real time. Um, you can see that uh, an interesting aspect of this, we, of course, we have the foster care system, which is DCYF, and OSPI, which is our statewide system of um, K-12 uh, public instruction. The student achievement is our higher ed authority. We also have the Department of Commerce because in our state we have an Office of Homeless Youth Protect Prevention and Protection and it's located in the Department of Commerce uh, as well as the Office of Refugee and Immigrant Services because when we talk about foster youth in this group, um, we are including in that definition youth in state care as well as youth in tribal non-state care and um, federal foster youth and the, the Office of Refugee and Immigrant Services is the state office that administers the, the federal foster care program for uh, unaccompanied refugee minors in our state. Uh, and below you can see the nonprofit organizations that are involved in this work. Um, there are also a mix of nonprofits that care about 
both young people from foster care and young people experiencing unaccompanied youth homelessness. So when this group met, we first looked at some data, uh, first of all, to understand what data we had and what gaps we had in the data, and then also to understand what uh, the data was showing us about where the kind of our baseline um, for educational outcomes. Um, and so I'm just going to show you a couple slides um, that were uh, created from some reports um, that were generated through this work. So um, this should shock no one, but foster youth and those experiencing unaccompanied homelessness um, have huge issues with absenteeism. So both groups miss about a third of school days each year in their K-12 experience. They are less likely to meet standards, they're less likely to graduate on time, and they have big challenges with uh, unplanned school transitions. You can see here our four-year high school graduation rates by foster care and youth homelessness status disaggregated by race. So, I'll just pause and say that this group, um, it has been our intention from the beginning to adopt a meaningful race equity lens when we think about recommendations we're making to the legislature to improve student outcomes. We know that there's huge racial disproportionality within the child welfare system there's similar racial disproportionality within the population of unaccompanied homeless youth. Um, and we know that when you're talking education outcomes, um, students of color are disproportionately affected um, and have disproportionately poor outcomes. Um, and so that's what we see here. And we are um, doing all we can, and again, to um, struggle with this race equity conversation within the context of working with these state agencies. It is not easy, um, but we are trying to do that meaningfully. And um, we hope that that will lead to recommendations for targeted strategies to support students of color within um, these groups. Um, you can see here higher education enrollment by foster care status and by homelessness status. So something that jumped out to us here is that um, we have obviously low enrollment from these groups, but for those who enroll, almost 90% of these students are attending two-year institutions. And so when we think about where in the post-secondary system we really need to, um, we really need to um, put our resources um, for these students, we know it, it has to start with our community and technical college system. Um, and, and that I think is consistent with a lot of findings in other states like um, California, which um, Amy was talking about, the John Burton Foundation. And we know that they have data that shows similar um, trends in California. So this is probably not unique to Washington State. I just want to acknowledge that when we we're thinking about baseline data. We were thinking about qualitative and quantitative data. And so we, um, we had our state office that does, that analyzes um, education data, conduct the um, qualitative data analysis, but we also did a lot of surveying interviews and focus groups with um, a wide variety of stakeholders. And so when we were capturing baseline data, you know, we had a lot of, um, we had a lot of um, qualitative as well as quantitative data because we know that the qualitative data is critical to understanding gaps. Um, I mean, the quantitative data is critical, but the qualitative data helps us see a lot of context that the numbers don't show. And so this slide is just three quotes, but we had um, hundreds of um, different individuals who we got um, uh, data from um, to help, you know, kind of paint the context for us um, to go with the numbers to help us understand where we are uh, today. So 
a quick, so after, after looking at data, understanding our gaps in data, understanding what we think the, ben, the, uh, the kind of baseline data is telling us, we um, also were building a project timeline. Um, and this is just a very high level summary to give you a sense of where the group has been and where we are headed. Um, but uh, we started in October 2017. Um, we were at the proviso that came through um, that kind of codified our work and required state agents, agencies to participate actually happened in the 2018 session. And so we had kind of new members coming on board um, for a period of about six, the first six months of the life of this group. Um, and then in the fall and winter, we did a lot of work basically to um, put together our first set of recommendations. And then in the, uh, in the, the winter, the very beginning of the legislative session 2019, um, this report was submitted to the legislature. And um, it articulates an, uh, a goal that by 2027, um, there will be equitable outcomes that are achieved for, for our um, students. And I will say that this goal is, there's still a lot of kind of defining work we need to do um, with this goal in terms of uh, being really uh, specific, what we mean by uh, equity and, and parity. Um, but this was a first pass at setting this goal and setting an ambitious goal so that when we are making decisions, we can ask ourselves, is this going to help us um, reach this impact goal by our, um, on, on our timeline. Um, and, if, you know, the way these things work, we're not 100% um, you know, sure by any means that we're going to, you know, hit the mark by 2027, but we hope that having the goal will really help us um, work with urgency um, across systems. So uh, the link to this full report with all the recommendations is in, is in this PowerPoint. And um, like I said, Amy uh, will have it to send it around. So I'm not going to go through um, all the recommendations this, the, the, this group came up with, but I do just want to give you a sense of the three really high level goal areas um, that, we, that we established. Um, so the first was, um, that we were telling the legislature they have to make ample investments to build systems capacity across agencies, schools, communities to ensure educational success of these students. So just as one example here, we know that many of the strategies that we currently use to support uh, students are unfunded. So think McKinney-Vento program uh, in K-12. Um, this is a federal program that is drastically underfunded. I think in all of Washington State, we get about a million dollars of federal funding to support McKinney-Vento work, and we have almost 300 school districts in our state. So um, this recommendation is really just saying um, it's not enough to talk about single points of contact um, if these folks um, aren't um, paid for and adequately trained and supported, which is something that I think um, is evident to many, many of us, um, but we're codifying that recommendation. And then so what you would see in the report is a, a list of strategies that would specifically address what this means with respect to policy making and budgeting. Um, the second recommendation is that in addition to making investments in capacity, systems need to be aligned and coordinated, and um, we need to better monitor outcomes um, so that we can sort of track progress. So um, we just see a lot of misalignment um, in policy, in programs, and in, and in practices um, across our state, and it's it's we see this misalignment between um, like urban and rural areas, but we, we often see it also just in the, in the same districts. So different definitions um, are applied um, to students, different, um, different um, 
uh, eligibility criteria are applied to students. Um, different um, sets of criteria are, may, are, are used to make decisions for students who need the same, trying to get access to the same supports or um, are just trying to find um, stability. And so what, what this recommendation is about is really um, how can we de-silo and how can we work with more fidelity um, across um, and within systems? And again, um, there's a whole list of specific strategies that kind of go along with this recommendation um, that talk about what we think needs to change for this to happen. The third recommendation is we, we just, it, you know, we think we have huge gaps in data, both data that helps us understand um, retrospectively, like how students and really how systems are performing. Um, and we, we have a very limited, um, practitioners have very limited access to real time individualized um, student level data that, that could really help them provide uh, the services and supports that students need in a timely manner. And this is a complicated issue. It, it obviously has to do with FERPA. It has to do with um, uh, different um, policies that state agencies and school districts have around data sharing. So this has been a, an issue that has been a puzzle for us for decades, but um, we think there's some real opportunity to um, think differently about how we can um, leverage this data um, to improve and track the way our system is performing and to make, to, to individually support students um, much, much more effectively in real time. So again, there's a list of strategies in the full report that talk about what would need to change in order to actualize this recommendation. So here's the link. So when you get this PowerPoint, you can just click on this link and you can read the full report. Um, and I think you will find it uh, interesting and relevant. Um, it is about 80 pages, but only the first um, 20 or so are the actual report and the other 60 pages are all supporting uh, information, just so you know. Um, it is um, pretty easy to read. So I'm going to pause there and just say that um, we're really excited about the work of Project Education Impact. Uh, this is a group that we think will endure. And um, we've really just been through one kind of cycle of making recommendations and presenting them to the legislature and then seeing what happens during the legislative session, seeing what um, changes because of the recommendations we're making. So we had, a good, uh, we had some good results this session. Um, and it was really just the first year of doing this work with the nonprofit state agencies and schools uh, setting a common agenda together. And um, I actually just got out of a meeting this morning um, where we were doing kind of a debrief of the, the session together. And um, we're excited that the next phase of this work will be a lot more effective because we, we kind of know what we're doing now. Um, and the first year and a half was really kind of just trying to set a foundation for the work. Um, so I'm going to pivot now, and I just have one slide on the Washington Passport Network, but this is kind of a really important part of the story. So I mentioned PEI is really focused on making these policy and budget recommendations to the legislature so that we have um, a policy framework and, and adequate state resources to really fund um, programs and systems. But we also know that, that that's only part of the solution. So um, professionals, in order to do this work, need adequate, adequate training, technical assistance. Um, they need opportunities to meet in their communities, in their regions, and um, statewide to coordinate practice and really talk about um, what's working on the ground and um, what isn't working and um, sharing learning um, in, in con continuously. So um, we, uh, we have a community of practice we call the Washington Passport Network. And this includes professionals who support um, 
young people from foster care and those serving unaccompanied homeless youth um, in secondary and post-secondary education and training um, and uh, includes folks working for nonprofits, schools, state agencies, um, and, and CSF provides the backbone support for this network. So um, there's a website I really encourage you to look at. It's www.washingtonpassportnetwork.org. Um, and the website is a really important aspect of the support we provide to the network. So prior to a couple of years ago, if you wanted to learn about things like project education impact or um, things like the Passport uh, to Careers Scholarship, which I'm going to talk about in a second, um, there was no central place on the internet that you could find all this information organized in a way that was navigable. Um, but our website does that. Um, and also, um, we have um, a directory of all of our um, campus champions. So all of our people who are um, designated support staff for foster and homeless youth on college campuses across the state um, lives on our directory so that people, um, professionals and students can find those folks easily. Um, and we write a blog and we, we promote events, network uh, events through that website as well. So I encourage you to look at it. Um, so throughout the year, we, we provide um, technical training and technical assistance to um, colleges who have campus-based um, su student support programs, which I'm going to talk about in a, in a second, but those are kind of funded by the Passport to Careers program. Um, we, we organize regional roundtables on a quarterly basis in communities across the state to really talk about um, coordinate, coordinate, service coordination. And so like a lot of what we talk about here is um, that transition from high school to post-secondary. We know that students um, often have a circle of support uh, in post second or in in secondary, and then through the transition to post secondary, uh, a lot of things can happen. And what really should happen is that the student should um, work with their circle of support to figure out how that's going to evolve and change as they move into post secondary. And um, instead, what we see is either the students like lose everyone, or a bunch of people cluster around the student without coordinating. And both of those things can have bad effects for the student. And so these service coordination groups are pulling professionals together to talk about what are our practices with respect um, to uh, serving students effectively and, and in a non-redundant way. Um, and especially around that transition, how are we working with each other so that we are communicating and we don't uh, drop a student inadvertently or overwhelm them um, by clustering around them without ourselves coordinating. And then we also um, facilitate a statewide uh, advisory council called the Passport Leadership Team. Um, it's about a 25 member group that meets quarterly to advise um, the state agency that administers the Passport to Careers program. And that's our kind of um, platform for um, advising and stakeholder engagement at, at that um, state level. So I've talked about project education impact. I've talked about the Washington Passport Network. And I want to end with talking about the Passport to Careers program. And this is the actual uh, scholarship and student support program for young people from foster care and young people who've um, experienced unaccompanied youth homelessness. So um, this program has been around since 2007, but it just got hugely expanded in 2018. I'm gonna explain that. So Passport to Careers is the name of the overall program. It has two programmatic pathways, both, so Passport to College is for students who are pursuing um, a two or four year um, degree or certificate or training programs. There's really students who are pursuing campus-based programs and have a financial aid package. Um, we also have another programmatic pathway in Passport to Careers that's called Passport to Apprenticeship Opportunities. And um, this is really for students who are pursuing 
um, non-campus based apprenticeship opportunities, um, pre-apprenticeship and apprenticeship opportunities. So these are um, like union based programs um, or other skilled trades uh, programs that are not based on a community and technical college campus. So a student wouldn't have a financial aid package in the past. These students would not have been eligible for financial support um, through Passport, but now that now they are. Um, it's really innovative and really interesting and it's really new. We're still building out the details of this, um, but excited that students who, are, uh, who uh, pursue apprenticeship opportunities will get support whether or not they're on a college campus. So um, the basics of Passport to Careers, like I said, it was founded in 07 and uh, really significantly expanded in 2018. Um, it is a state funded need based financial aid program. And in, in Washington State, we don't have a tuition waiver system for foster youth. What we do is we have stacking um, financial aid um, components. So a student um, from foster care will get their full Pell Grant, they'll get their um, full Washington State state need grant. Um, and then stacking on top of that, they will get the passport to college funding. And the, um, the result is that it's more powerful than um, a tuition waiver because it will cover the student's full uh, cost of attendance, not just their tuition and fees, if, um, if everything goes the way it's supposed to go. So if the student is getting all the money that they're eligible for. And our, so our biggest challenge is just communicating to students um, what they're actually eligible for. Um, because it's a, it's a little more complex than a simple waiver system. So um, Passport provides uh, up to 4,500 additional state dollars in a student's package based on their uh, cost of attendance and need. It's good for uh, 15 terms or the equivalent um, up until, uh, up through age 26. So a student can receive passport funding until they turn age 27. And then in addition to the money, students who participate receive tailored support services. And those are um, uh, led or um, the person eligible or the person accountable for delivering those services are uh, designated support staff in the student services office of a, of a campus and um, we also have um, in the financial aid um, offices a point of contact as well. So to be eligible for Passport to Careers, um, you, this, is, this is speaking to our, the expansion, the recent expansion. So it used to be for Passport that you basically had to age out of care at age 18, and it was only for students in state care. But now um, we're talking about students in Washington state care, in federal foster care, and in tribal foster care, including students who are in tribal care but not state care. Uh, students have to enroll at least half time before their 22nd birthday to activate their scholarships. They have to uh, maintain Washington state residency um, and be pursuing their first bachelor's and maintain SAP. Um, starting July 1, um, unaccompanied homeless youth will be eligible for Passport. And this is a, an exciting experiment. Um, We're still, uh, it's about to go live. There's been a lot of planning um, on the implementation of this. Um, obviously, there's some pretty big differences with how we um, track information about students with um, unaccompanied homelessness experience versus foster youth. Um, and so the way that we verify whether or not they're uh, eligible for um, a program like Passport is gonna be different and we're gonna learn a lot in the next couple of years about how to make the experience a good one for students. Um, but we're um, really excited that this group will be included in our mission population because our hypothesis is that, uh, first of all, they were likely students that should have been served by the child welfare system, um, but weren't. Um, due to systems capacity issues. Um, and second of all, we, we just think that they need very similar supports 
to be successful um, in post-secondary as our foster youth. So we hope that by serving them, we're really gonna be able to help move the needle on their education outcomes. This is just a reminder that we added the apprenticeship opportunities pathway and that um, this is also really new for us, but there's, um, there, we're, we're figuring out what it's gonna look like. So on, uh, for students in the apprenticeships to receive tailored support services. So on college campuses, a participating institution has to basically sign up to be a passport school. And when they do that, they um, designate their points of contact and they develop a program plan that talks about the services that they provide students from foster care, passport scholars, um, and then they get state money. They get $500 per term per student to help um, fund or supplement the funding for the tailored support programs. So that's been the framework for the student support programs um, on campuses. And with these non-campus based apprenticeship programs, um, we also envision students receiving tailored support services, but what that will look like um, is, is going to be something we're going to figure out over the next couple of years. So this is just a, a matrix that shows there's kind of this, um, this um, uh, incremental expansion of eligibility that was required um, to, um, to kind of expand the program this much. Um, so we're doing it in phases. Um, something I haven't talked about is that the time and care piece, and this maybe is the most important piece about this program expansion is, um, so before it was not only, only, it was only for state foster youth who turned 18 in care. And now we're saying this program is for foster youth who had any experience of foster care after the age of 13, starting July, 2020. And so we're stepping that down incrementally. So uh, this year, this academic year, it was for youth in, who'd had any experience of foster care after age 15, starting July 1, 2019, it'll go down to 14, and then 2020, it'll go down to 13. And then after that, it'll be any experience in foster care after age 13. And this, um, of course, aligns to the FAFSA. So we had been having a lot of challenges with the FAFSA um, question, the, the foster care question. So students would um, say that they were, uh, had had foster care experience and they'd be considered an independent student per the FAFSA, but then they'd apply for passport or they'd inquire about it and they'd learn they weren't eligible. And it just was very confusing that students would be considered independent due to their foster care status on the FAFSA, but not receive passport. And so we're, we're aligning those things so that any student um, who, who does um, qualify as an independent student due to their foster care or homelessness status will also be considered a passport scholar going forward. Just in terms of numbers, um, to give you a sense of the scale of this expansion, um, we, uh, for the last 10 years, about 700 students have been eligible per year to be passport scholars and about 350 per year have utilized the scholarship. So about a 50% utilization rate over the first 10 years of the program. We expect, we don't have super great data to do these projections, but we have some data and we, and it leads us to believe that this program could expand um, eight to 10 times in the next three years um, so that by 2020, we might see five to 6,000 eligible students in our state. And, and our goal is to keep the utilization rate stable. So we'd see the, the, utilize, the number of students utilize, utilizing the program go from about 350 a year to potentially somewhere in the range of two to 3,000 a year. So it's a, a big, um, it's a very meaningful expansion in terms of numbers. Uh, the way that students um, ver get verified for this program is they fill out this simple form um, and then they submit it to the Student Achievement Council and it, it clarifies if they were state dependent, federally dependent, or tri uh, tri dependent of a tribal system. Um, we do have uh, um, uh, agencies are 
child welfare and higher ed agencies have a data sharing agreement. So they can just, if they were state care, they can just match the student and um, it, it happens pretty quickly um, that the students can be verified, usually 24 to 72 hours, something like that. Um, they are building um, a similar data, uh, data share agreement with our, um, for our URM students. The tribal work is really different um, and requires a lot of work with tribes to, uh, in partnership with the tribes to um, figure out um, the best way to verify student status. But um, basically we, we will be reaching out to tribes when we see the student was dependent of a tribal child welfare system and then um, go through the right communication channels and then the tribe, as long as they basically say that the student um, was in fact dependent um, and that to the extent that meets criteria, then the student will um, be considered eligible. So um, for Passport, uh, just to recap, what students have to do to get the scholarship is they have to fill out their FAFSA or WAFSA. Uh, they submit that consent form. They enroll before age 22 and maintain SAP. Um, and then we have um, our professionals in the Washington Passport Network their case managers, their um, campus points of, um, uh, their designated support staff on campuses and so forth, working with them to um, really um, make sure that as they, if they do everything right, that also the system does everything right. We know that um, sometimes there are, you know, um, situations where the student does everything correct to get passport or financial aid in general, um, but something happens and um, they either get a wrong package or a confusing package or a package that's not in their best interest. And so um, it's great that we have this um, scholarship program set up for them, but we also know there's just always going to be a role for um, student support and advocacy. And that's, that's why we pair the, the Washington network, the training for professionals, these professional staff to make sure they have great information, accurate information about how the program works. So that when they're, um, helping students access it um, and then, you know, just persist in, in college that um, they actually have good information to help the students get what they, what they need and are eligible to receive. Because um, one of actually the biggest challenges we have had historically is that the professionals that are helping students have inaccurate information themselves. And so that leads to a lot of downstream consequences. Um, so again, just, uh, just highlighting there why the Washington Passport Network is a critical strategy that kind of supports students getting the most out of Passport. That's my last slide. And um, when Amy sends out the PowerPoint, um, the last slide includes my information and my colleagues, Molly and Donna at College Success Foundation. We're happy to answer any questions you might have. And um, there's also uh, someone we look, work really, really closely with is Don Cipriano McCafferty, and she works for the Student Achievement Council. She's the program manager for the Passport program. So there may be questions that are technical in nature that we don't have the answer to, uh, but Don will. And she's great, responsive, and happy to answer questions as well. And with that, Amy, uh, I think I'm through with my slides. Okay, great. Well, thanks so much, Fred. Um, so I'm going to give everybody uh, a little bit of time to type in any uh, your questions that you have for Fred. So if you go ahead and do that. And so one question um, that, that I wrote down actually is uh, what is the P20 continuum? That you oh have? yeah, it just means um, preschool to through post-secondary and to career. Okay. So sometimes we talk about the K12, um, but the P20 is the full, the full continuum to include early learning and post-secondary education and training. Okay, great. Okay. So the next question is, how have you gone about building relationships with the uh, state legislators? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, I, I mean, I think what I have to say about that is we have, we just, 
have done individual agent, individual um, advocacy groups and nonprofit organizations in our state have done work over decades to build ongoing relationships with folks who are in the legislature now, um, folks who've been there for a long time and newer members. Um, so that work, you know, is year round work that I, I think in Washington state, we do have a, a special um, legislature that's very committed to um, underserved populations and specifically foster and homeless youth. And, and there's a very specific interest in helping those students do well in their education. But having said that, one of our biggest historical challenges has, as, as a group of uh, nonprofits and advocacy groups and coalitions having a common agenda. And so although we have champions in the legislature who want to help uh, and support our students, sometimes we have um, ourselves done our, uh, created confusion and competition um, uh, with legislature, which, with legislators. And so um, with Project Education Impact, that is our, our best kind of thinking and strategy about how we can work together in a way that's coordinated and strategic so that we get the best results um, with our legislative champions as opposed to um, competing with each other and causing confusion, and, which leads um, to less good results. And, and that's kind of been um, our history. And so that's where we're really trying to change our approach. Um, and, and if you have more specific questions about how we've built individual relationships with our legislative champions over the years, I'd be happy to talk more about that offline. Okay, and the next question is, how do you think the passport work will change when you start working with homeless youth and how will you recruit homeless youth? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, this is, this is not really a concrete answer, but I would just say, I think it's gonna change a lot. And I also don't know all the ways in which it's gonna change things because it is unknown territory for us. Um, but, something, but I have a hope about this, which is that I hope that it will force our practitioners and our systems to really do more student-centered work and to understand that, um, you know, even within the foster care environment, uh, you know, you think about the different backgrounds young people have, it is not a homogenous population as we all know. Um, but sometimes, we, you know, we, we, but we set up these programs that are um, rigid and, uh, and formulaic. And I think part of the reason we don't see great outcomes is because the, the, the programs the, uh, and systems really do not hold students at the center. I think that, and I think we've known that for many years, right? So um, there's lots of ways to, to try to strengthen programs and create programmatic environments where um, supports can be individualized to students' needs. I think that as we bring on unaccompanied homeless youth, it's really gonna break down this idea that students like that there is a one size fits all approach. It, it just isn't going to be the case. Students who are unaccompanied and homelessness, uh, unaccompanied and homeless will need different, um, in some, maybe in some cases similar, but in some cases different supports um, to, you know, do well in school over time and complete their, their degrees or programs. So um, I think that's really going to, um, be a, both a challenge and a benefit of adopting the new population. Um, there are some really specific technical differences that I could speak to. Um, if, if anyone is curious, like how we're going to verify those students or um, like the part of the question about how we're going to sort of market the program and raise the awareness about it, both with students and with folks in the homeless youth uh, service uh, uh, providing community. I'd be happy to um, follow up with anyone who has specific questions about those strategies that we're using. 
Okay, well, we haven't had any other questions come in, so I think we will wrap up here. So thank you so much, Fred. I really appreciate you presenting and talking with us today. Um, and thanks everyone for coming. And just a reminder that um, this webinar and all the other webinars that we've done will be posted, are posted on our website, both the recordings as well as the slides. And feel free to reach out um, to Fred if you have other questions about the Washington Passport Program or to me, or if you have any questions about the National Research Collaborative. Okay, thank you so much everyone for coming today. And thanks, Fred. All right, thanks, Amy. Bye. Bye.